Hello, everyone. So I'd like to start with this image that kind of represents the main difference between countries like Sweden on the left and the country where I come from, Italy. So this is a uh, train ticketing machine. There's the specific part to accept credit cards. but There's also a label specifically designed to say it's not going to work ever. <laughs> Forget about it. So I'm an interaction designer at Frog. Uh, we've just turned 50. I'm not 50, but my company is. And uh, we've been working with many companies in many different industries. And no matter what you're designing, of course, payments are such a fundamental basic interaction that you perform throughout the day. So eventually, uh, we have to think of how to, to encourage these people here to move towards more uh, cashless society. And if you think of paying, mm, Basically, it's just sharing uh, a piece of information. And uh, as a designer, I'm very fascinated by how changing this medium can enhance the, the experience itself. Um, Jonas already explained that, but basically we moved from tools where the uh, value was embedded in the tool itself. These are manias from uh, West Africa to something more practical, a piece of paper, and now we're seeing uh, your body, your face being the trust element of the transaction. And as technology continuously evolves, we have so many tremendous features that we can leverage for our design. Still, from a service design perspective, I would say it, it's not just technology itself can help you uh, encouraging people to get rid of cash. Uh, we need to think more on a broader level. It's about inclusion. It's about uh, the role of privacy, identity. There are so many different aspects that can better inform uh, the, our design. And I mean, if an old lady in Sicily uh, is not using her debit card because she's scared of losing money, Apple Pay won't, won't solve that. So instead of thinking on replicating the, the same experience that we currently do with physical um, devices, can be a card or a phone, we should kind of reimagine the way payments are embedded in our daily experiences. Think about Netflix. So they basically moved from renting movies with a DVD to streaming, and they reinvented completely their service. So it's not just about renting a movie, but it's getting tailored content. They are becoming the producers of their content. It's, it's groundbreaking. So when we, when we have to think of how to um, find the value for people to get rid of cash, instead of focusing on technology, which is, of course, needed, we need to take a step back and think of how. So um, it can be because you're in a hurry and you need to catch a train and you need an easy way to buy a ticket. It can be because you're at the restaurant and you need to split the bill with your friends. So these are probably some triggers that can help people to kind of change their daily behavior. And at Frog, we do this by talking with users, with real people. We call this design research. Um, there are many different design research methodologies. Uh, the one that I will show you today uh, is about three um, in-field research we did in three different countries, uh, in different industries. And basically, the idea here, here is that we, we go there in people's houses in their daily context, and we, we want to observe and understand how they, they do their daily things. This helps us to have a more diverse perspective better inform our design, bring value to business, and, and at the end make products and services that make sense to, to these people. And um, after doing research, there's the big part in which we, collect, we connect the dots and we find patterns. And these are some archetypes around uh, the use of cash. Uh, and it's not about gender, age, demographics. It's, it's more about behaviors needs and attitudes um, around these teams. So we will start by seeing the skeptics. Last year, I was in uh, Riyadh and Jeddah in Saudi Arabia. Um, a telco company asked us to explore how they could expand their services, also in the financial services area. And Saudi Arabia is 
a very interesting country. Things are changing so fast. Women now can drive, but still, if you try to order an Uber or Karim, which is the Middle East version of Uber, the, the ride has been cancelled because drivers don't want to accept cards. Uh, Saudi people love online shopping. They do like at 2 a.m., but still they don't trust uh, using cards and they pay uh, on delivery. And credit cards are also perceived as haram, like forbidden by, by their religion because of the interests that you have to pay on it. So we, we went in people's houses. Sorry about this GDPR, you know. And um, we were talking with this woman, uh, showing some ideas around how to save money. And we, we instantly realized that she wasn't able to do anything in Saudi because she's a, she's a doctor, a refugee from Syria, and she didn't have any credit score in Saudi Arabia. So all the digital payments were not uh, accessible for her. And um, when we showed her a concept about how to um, use the roundups of every transaction to create a savings account, she was like, yeah, but this is the Jamia. And we were like, what, excuse me? So we, we learned actually that there are these rituals um, very based on how people interact with each other. Uh, every country has its own ritual. I don't know if you have here in Sweden as well. In Mexico, it's called Tanda. So basically, a, a bunch of people, friends, uh, gather uh, frequently, like one, one month, every month. And uh, the scope, basically, the concept of this is to collect money. So you give a fee, a monthly fee, and you, you save your money. And at the same time, the host of the party, because it's something that happens in, in a house uh, where people eat and hang out each other, the host can get uh, an instant loan. So they basically have a very uh, interesting model of peer-to-peer -peer lending that then we realize that it's something that actually exists on a digital format. This is an app in Egypt called Moneyfellow. And th this is great because it's not just scaling up um, a physical experience, but basically by creating this model, people like Gada that we saw before can create a credit score history and can access to instant loans and, and stuff like that. So being, make sure that these services are inclusive for people are a fundamental step to, to boost the, the awareness and the usage of cashless. The second ones are the conservatives, Italians. <laughs> we were in uh, Bari. A major bank in Italy asked us to um, think of a service to uh, better manage and get aware of how much you're spending. And we had a huge competitor, which wasn't an app. It was a wallet. <laughs> uh, people love to use cash in Italy. It's so easy for them. You just go to the ATM, you take money, and that's your weekly budget. You open your wallet and you see how much money you have left. It's very tangible. You don't need to swipe through notifications, being identified. It, it just works. So when we, when we were showing these people some, uh, some ideas, um, they were really interested not by the cold analytical data, like here's the pie chart of your monthly expenses per category, but they were really interested in an extra layer on top of it, a more friendlier tone of voice. Like in this example, uh, I'm not just telling you that you spend money on a certain category, but it's more about, hey, you know that you're spending more on that comparing to last month? Why don't we set up a challenge? So next month you can maybe save some money. Or another really interesting aspect was that people don't really trust automatic payments, specifically when it comes to pay your utility bills. But at the same time, they were looking for uh, a more seamless experience. So they really liked even simple ideas like having a notification that is reminding you, hey, in three days, you have to pay your bill, pay now. And this triggered their minds because they were, they were realizing, this is cool, but the only way the app can know about my transactions is by start using my debit card, not just to go to the ATM. And by introducing these little changes, you can, you can change slowly people's mindset and potentially moving towards a more and more 
I wouldn't say cashless, but probably less cash society. Third one, about the pragmatic people. So these are the people that are not so fanatic about a technology. I'm probably more on the, on the upper level. I'm, I'm the early bird. I try everything that comes new uh, out of technology. These people are only interested in uh, it works, fine, let's use it because it saves time. Germans. <laughs> we were in the cold Munich working for a um, car company. And the ultimate goal was to create um, a better experience for EV uh, owners. Because when it comes to uh, charge your car, it's a mess. Uh, every charging station has a different account. You need a different card. This guy here um, used to have 24 cards because of the range anxiety. I mean, you, you, you have to charge your car no matter what. So um, the, the final product of this was a service that allow you to get rid of all of these cards and have just one single account. But we kind of challenged our client and we said, but what if you go beyond? What if the, if the wallet becomes your enabling platform to do something more? What if you have the app store of your car? Or what if by just, your, by just parking your car, you pay? by just uh, charging your car, you pay, but more, even more. So what if the delivery guy of a laundry app can access your trunk and charge your car? So going back to, to the example um, that I showed you at the beginning, the probably one way to, to go beyond these frictions, like the example here on the right, is not trying to replicate an existing experience. So this is the train ticketing machine in Milano, while this is the metro station in Milano. Last year, they launched this new ticketing system, similar to the one in London, where you can basically pay to uh, access any metro station. And the action of paying is the ticket itself. Why do we need a paper ticket if the transaction itself has more meaningful data in it? The, the credit card, the debit card, knows how many times I traveled during a day, so you can have a daily cap. The card can know maybe that you're going to a concert, and maybe the concert can offer you a free ticket for that day. And they showed some data that uh, in Milano, after they launched the service, 20% of the tickets they sell now are contactless. So, uh, when it comes to design for cashless in these countries, no matter what technology can offer, and I'm sure that in the future we will have more and more amazing technology that can support our experiences, still, as designers, we have the responsibility, I would say, to take a step back again and think of finding values and make sure that everyone can have access to this technology in a more human-friendly way, and of course, it has, to, it has to work, it has to be seamless and frictionless. Thank you. <laughs>